Hi, Jada. Thanks so much for coming on the Sir Thriving podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, Lisa. So happy to be here. Me too. Um, I start every episode with one question. You can answer it any way that you feel comfortable. And that is, are you surviving or thriving? You know, I'm right smack in the middle. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, Because I'm actually in the process of, they actually have a name for it. It's called the Swedish Death Cleanse. Um, which sounds awful, but what it really is, is minimizing and getting rid of all the things that don't serve you any longer. Mm. So in that regard, I feel like I am really on the, the, the razor's edge of what it is to be thriving because I'm really letting go of things that no longer serve me. So, um, and I think that's been a process for many, many years. It's been a slow unraveling, but I would say that I... I'm 80% thriving and 20% unleashing and unpacking and letting go of things that really no longer align with my highest version of me. Yeah, I love that. That's such a good analogy. Um, It kind of reminded me of like a snake, like shedding its skin that like no longer protects them or serves them or whatever it may be. And the first guest to use like the percentage analogy, I think, I think that's a good objective way to just like lay it out. So can you share with our listeners just a little bit about yourself, the wonderful work that you do with women? And it's in your bio, the why behind you empower women to connect to their authentic self through mind, body and soul. I'm a medical trained physician assistant and I have spent the last decade specializing in psychiatry and I'm also a therapist and so I blend more like a holistic wellness and holistic psychiatry in my like day job and um, I'm also a personal trainer and so I kind of swirled all that into Solvia Soul and Solvia Soul is really this essence of that we embody so that the soles of our feet, literally the S O L E is the embodiment of understanding that our body is an instrument and it's a tool and it's a vessel. And it's through that embodiment really of learning how to love ourselves and connect deeply to ourselves that we kind of find our soul's purpose. Like, why are we here? You know, the overarching holistic wellness and healing is really blending the medical training with like what to eat and how to move your body and the sciencey part of that. And you kind of combine those and help clients be able to thrive in the combination of all of your skills. Um, I love that you've combined the medical with the holistic, with the wellness, um, with the personal training, so many variety of like hats that you wear. I think I keep molting myself, like even in my business is how do I best serve? And, and, you know, sometimes people need help with nutrition. Sometimes people need help with having accountability with moving their body. And then there's the science of understanding, you know, we can actually change our mental health with what we eat and we can change our gut biome with exercise. It's not just about what we eat and all of that impacts our mental health. And and I think, you know, we all kind of want to thrive, right? Like we want to do our best. We want to feel successful. We want yeah. to feel love and we want to have healthy relationships. And like we want to have all these markers of like success or thriving, right? And wellness in mind and body is kind of right at the top of what most people sort of strive for. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that we Mm -hmm. live in such a modern world, right? And so there's this societal pressure that people may lean into. And when I was like getting ready for this conversation with you, I could just think about like all the stuff online, like the expensive skincare, the 5 a.m. morning routines, and you have to do this and do this to be able to like thrive and have your health and wellness be at like top tier. And a lot of the times that's not really realistic for the modern day person. Um, and I I don't know, the modern day person, I kind of like think of myself, like I don't get up at 5 AM because I'm just not doing that. Um, and so like in your definition, like what exactly is health and wellness to like the human body and experience? Oh, wow. That is such a good question. You know, I think it's a deep honoring of our connecting back to ourselves and to your point, we can get really busy with the, I need to get up and do this at 5 a.m. and then check this box off and check this box off and check this box off. But that's really living in a uh, in, in a very uh, heady way, in a very linear, logical way. Mm-hmm. And I think with all the advances of technology and even the advances of medicine, what I'm noticing and what I'm feeling and what I think people are really yearning for 
is to really go back to what it is to live more of a heart-centered way, to really listen to what your, your body is saying. We've lost how to listen to our bodies. We've lost that connection with our breath. And it's, it's really that whole idea of using our body as a vessel. It's an instrument. And we've, we've, we've tuned out. We don't know how to hear. So I think that deep connection and getting back to that soulful way of living is really going to be our best guide when it comes to what is my body needing. So I really think that as we've gotten more connected with social media, what is actually happening is we've gotten more disconnect to our bodies and our soul's calling and just our intuition. Like we, we live more up here and less here. Mm -hmm. And I think living from this heart centered space is always going to be a better guide to what our bodies need to be. I love that. That's so empowering. And like, I don't even know what to say in response to that. (laughs) (laughs) I think sometimes we just need to be like, wait a second, just stop. And like, what is it do you want to do? What makes you feel good? I feel like that's really important for women like in their 30s as well, because that's like my audience is just like what feels good to you. And just because like your friend or that social media person is running three miles or three marathons a year, like doesn't mean that you have to do it. For sure. And you hit on one really important word, feel, because we don't feel we're so busy thinking and doing that we we don't pause to feel deeply. And that's where I think it's almost like there's this, you know, this image of like a a dog chasing his tail, you know, it's like, there's this, this constant need for self-improvement and self-empowerment and self, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and really sometimes all the things that we truly want and desire will come when we just stop. Yeah. There's so much, I think, about health and wellness that comes with rest. Mm-hmm. And and especially when we talk about cortisol levels and how stress actually impacts our mental and physical health. And sometimes we need to just turn the dial down in order to gain more benefit. Yeah, I think we live in such a like hustle culture. Mm -hmm. And um, me specifically, I live in the Northeast. And so I have like New York City, like at my fingertips, and it's just hustle culture. Everyone is just like chasing their own tail or the tail or the person in front of them. And no one just like stops and tries to like engage with themselves. And I've seen that in myself and I call it personally like horizon syndrome, just like constantly being on like the other side of the fence and like wanting when I have that job, when I have this thing, I never for years, like through college, grad school, like my first, I never just took a second to like stop and like literally like smell the roses and it led to like stress and depression and like my cortisol, like I was having stomach issues and all this stuff. And it's still things that I'm trying to still sort out like now years later. Um, but it is really true. This like hustle culture I think is important, but can be like really damaging. Would you agree? I would. And I think in part, it's, it's especially in the United States, it's a little more uh, predominant. You know, I I was in uh, Portugal for um, a little bit. And there was this, this total sort of reset that happened there, where it was this embracing of a slowness that was quite refreshing. And it it was so impactful that it, it literally changed my life. And I thought, you know, this is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And we forget that it's in the present moment that we have any power at all ever. And that horizon syndrome is such a, it's a, it's a great way to to describe that feeling of never being good enough. Like you're always chasing that next ladder, that next step. And when you get there, you know, I call it moving the goalpost. Like you, you, you get there and you get the touchdown, you do the little dance and then you're like, oh, wait, the goalpost is over there now. And then we change it. We change what that definition of success or what we feel like we need to be happy or whatever weight we think is the goal or whatever the ideal is that we are constantly chasing. But it's in that moment where we meet ourselves in the stillness that we have the ability to just go, I'm good right now. Yeah. And one of my favorite phrases is in this moment, I have everything I need. Oh, I love that. 
And when we get all whirly twirly and, and we're spinning and we're chasing and we feel inadequate or not worthy, or we're still just, you know, struggling with our worth or whatever wellness goal we have or whatever we're chasing. If you can just pause and say, in this moment, I have everything I need. It can really just let those worries and those stresses just melt away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so important and can really ground someone um, and really force them to be present. So to any listener who is like, okay, Lisa and Jada, I heard the rant about this, that, and the other thing. I want to do this now. <laughs> They're like, I want to do this now. What are like the three major key steps that you do with like clients or what you would advise to someone who is really looking to like start their health and wellness holistic journey? So three main things I'm going to tell you. Um, okay. So I'm going to think three things that I do every day. This is how I feel like it sets the day. Now, you can get up at 5 a.m. if that's your jam. I would say get up when it makes sense for you. Um, but give yourself time. The biggest thing that that I have that I would tell someone if they're like wanting to make a change is you have to prioritize you. So unless mm -hmm. you're going to give yourself and ideally I would say an hour, but you know, if someone's really wanting to start a smaller bite, let's go half an hour. So give yourself some measure of time every day. So that's the big thing. You have to make sure that you're willing to invest in you because no one else is going to do it. So you have to know that you're going to set aside time for you. So that's, that's number one. Mm -hmm. And I like to do that in the morning. So in the morning, when my feet hit the floor, first thing I do is I drink a big glass of water because we get dehydrated when we sleep. And one of the first things we want to do is get our digestive system working. And I know this sounds like, what are you talking about? Get my digestive system working. <laughs> but it's, it's an important piece because our body is our vessel. So we get dehydrated when, our, when we sleep. So I hydrate first thing in the morning. And then I do a meditation. And when I say that word, that scares people off. And so I've, I'm not going to say that word. I'm going to say I sit in, I sit in stillness. I sit in stillness for some measure of time that will vary based upon what my body feels like it needs. So give yourself time, hydrate, get that gut uh, going, and then sitting in stillness. After I sit in stillness, I move my body. Usually that's a walk or a, or a bicycle ride, but I do those three things every single day. Sometimes I journal after I sit in stillness. Sometimes I will um, write in my gratitude journal. Like it'll just, that will depend. But setting aside time, hydrating to get your body um, ready to go for the day, sitting in stillness and then moving. So that yin yang of stillness and then movement. And those three things can change your life. I mean, that those are not terribly big things, but setting aside time to invest in you is absolutely number one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so important. And I think it's back to the whole like hustle culture. It's so easy to say like, well, I need to be logged on at work at this time and I need to do this or like take the kids here or do this. I don't have children, but like, you know, I'm sure parents feel like they're just rushed in the morning or in the evenings or whatever it is. And I heard you say a lot, like you can do things that are intentional for you. It just has to work with your lifestyle. Right. And so you don't have to do the 5 a.m. routines that we see people on Instagram doing. You can have a 5 p.m. routine if that's like where you want to do your stillness, like Jada was saying. That's okay. I'm actually like an evening person. So like my like workout stillness is in the evening. It, there's lots of things that are meditative and can be meditative. It's just you know, really to me, meditation is just meeting yourself in the moment and mm -hmm. we can do that anywhere, anytime. Yeah. So, that's so important to know. You know, it doesn't have to be like, I'm going to sit cross leg and chant. Uh, yeah. I've, I've actually don't ever do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, good to know. There you go. How can like someone 
because I've seen it in myself, so like I have my own insight. But I'm curious to hear it from you. How can someone recognize when when they're in that like hustle survival mode and they like really want to get out of it? Like, if there's like physiological things, if there's objective things. Yeah, often those will show up physically. So often when someone is struggling, when they're in hustle culture, it's gonna it's gonna come out some way. And often this is where our body is our biggest, our biggest teacher, because often it'll show up in gut issues, irritable mm. bowel. It'll show up with sleep issues. It'll show up with uh, headaches, with aches and pains uh, somewhere in our body. So often it'll be a physical manifestation because we don't often listen when we're stressed because we just we just keep pushing through and we keep pushing through until something breaks. Yeah. And usually the thing that breaks is something in our body that makes us pause and go, "Okay, fine. <laughs> I'm listening now." And so, you know, it's like our body whispers and we don't hear it and then it'll kind of be a little louder and we will still not hear it until it really screams at us. And that's when we usually will stop. And so often if we're dealing with a lot of physical or physiological issues or gut health issues, mental issues, sadness, depression, anxiety, where we're, we just feel like we're revved up all the time, where we have difficulty sitting down where we have difficulty in crowded spaces, we go in and feel like we have to leave, mm. like social anxieties can heighten when we are staying in hustle culture. But often it's a physiological, physical manifestation that is our body's way of telling us, slow down. Mm -hmm. And what is it in the brain that connects to the gut that will create that like reaction? Well, the vagus nerve like is our, is our big connector. But what's really cool is that, you know, the enteric nervous system, which is our, the nervous system in our gut is separate from our central nervous system. So oh um, I like to call it, we have three brains. We have our central nervous system. We have our enteric nervous system, which is the nervous system in our gut, which is why we get butterflies in our tummy, uh, mm -hmm. or we can feel nauseous when we're excited. And then the third one is actually in our heart. So there's some research that's actually now showing that there's bi-directional communication, not only from our gut to our brain, but from our heart to our brain. And mm. so they're always talking to each other. And what's cool about it is we used to think that it was top down, that it was the central nervous system, our brain kind of running the show. But what we've actually learned through more and more research is that there's actually more um, communication or called afferent neurons that run from our gut and from our heart to our brain than the other way. So that gut feeling or those those intuitions, those mm. nudges, those heartfelt uh, decisions, those are actually more real than necessarily our brain. Yeah. So, um, so it's really that, that listening and, and connecting and understanding that those signals from our gut go both ways and they actually go a little bit more from our gut to our brain than vice versa. Can you talk a little bit about how like food consumption and diet can really affect those nervous systems really talking to each other? Oh, for sure. So, and it's interesting. So the gut biome is this interconnection of, it's a mix of bacteria, yeast, and fungus all kind of living together in this slurry in our entire nervous system. It sounds kind of gross, but Basically, we have what are called good bacteria and bad bacteria. Now, yeah. they're not good or bad. It's just that the good bacteria are the ones that produce the neurotransmitters that our brain needs. So dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, all the things that our brain needs to function well, those are made in our gut. So 90% of our neurotransmitters that our brain needs our gut makes. So it's important to have a healthy gut to have a healthy brain. So some of the things that are going to encourage the good bacteria to inhabit our gut is to going to eat things that are high in fiber. So the good bacteria love fiber. The bad bacteria love sugar. So if you have a sweet tooth and you're craving a lot of sugar, it could mean that your gut biome is swayed a little bit more in the 
um, too many bad bacteria, so to speak, that are that are sending messages to your brain to eat more sugar. And that's what's really fascinating. Because if you have more bad bacteria in your gut because you've been eating a lot of sugar, because we have more neurons going from our gut to our brain, you're going to get lots of messages to your brain. Eat the cookie, eat the donut. Yeah. And it's because the bacteria in your gut are telling your brain that that's what they want. Now, that's just powerful. And if you think about that, if you switch it, and if you eat more fruits and vegetables and decrease the sugar, and especially the processed foods, and you have more probiotics and prebiotics in your diet, which are indigestible fibers, then you're going to sway the gut biome into more of a favorable good bacteria environment. And suddenly you're going to get cravings for broccoli and you're going to crave that salad and the fruit that you eat is going to be super sweet Mm -hmm. and it's going to satisfy that sort of sweet tooth. And you're going to then change your gut biome, which over time has the power to change your mood and improve your mental health. That's what I was just about to going to ask is like how like diet and like, I think we all know that, right? Like if you eat well and you eat right at baseline, you're going to be healthier. You're going to feel better. But, um, what's like the actual relation between like a healthy, good balanced diet and mental health. I'm curious about that, especially with like anxiety and depression. It really comes down to a diverse gut biome. Mm. So, and if we talk about that, kind of going back to, um, understanding this connection between mind and body, when, we have an, uh, a gut biome that's not healthy, that's not diverse, that can send off chemical messengers in our body that raise our inflammatory cascade. So our entire or most of our immune system lives in our gut. And so if we're in a high stress state all the time, our gut biome is going to be skewed in a not healthy way. That can cause an increase in inflammation. We now know that the underpinning of depression and anxiety is inflammation. So inflammation in the gut has now been linked to the reason for depression. And Mm -hmm. most diseases now are being linked to inflammation. So a diet that is an anti-inflammatory diet, and the diet that I recommend is the Mediterranean diet, which has been the most studied for its impact on not only physical health, but mental health, because it's got lots of fruits and vegetables, healthy fats, lean meats. And so those things lower inflammation. It really does all go back to that analogy of just like your body is a vessel and you have to feed the vessel the right things for the vessel to function properly. It sounds so like first grade language, but it is true that you you have to feed it the right things and take care of it and nourish it and rest and move and, mm-hmm. you know, stretch and strengthen and all of these things, because if not, you're just going to like crash and be in this like ongoing survival mode, which can lead to, you know, a slew of other mental health right. issues. And, and um, you know, you talked about like gut issues and all of that. Yeah. Which is, we have to start with our body, our body holds the trauma. Our body is the way that we heal not only our physical health, but our mental health and our emotional health. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's that whole saying of like the body keeps the score. It's, it's so true. And I think people, you know, might kind of like roll their eyes at it or be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's true. And like the next time you're in a stressful situation, notice how you feel and, you know, it might just bring you back to, you know, something that you experienced when you were younger and go, you know, switch a light bulb that says like, oh, this is like triggering. Um, I've definitely experienced that and it's a real thing. (laughs) A hundred percent because the body does remember. Yeah. So just like pivoting a little bit, you do a lot of like self-love work, which I love on your page and something that I'm always personally working on because who wouldn't want to just love themselves, right? (laughs) Um, to kind of ask like a hard hitting question, like, why is it so hard to love ourselves sometimes, Jada? Gosh, it's such a great question. And it's taken me years to learn that. And I am still learning that. And you kind of hit on it when you said subconscious programming, because that's really where it starts. It starts when we're little and our brain 
pattern actually is, is, um, it's in a different brainwave when we're children and it doesn't change until we get into like 12, 13. And then it goes into more of an alpha wave pattern when we're up, when we're older, but when we're younger, everything is literal. Like every, yeah. that's why it's so easy for us to live in our imagination and pretend that there are sharks swimming on the ground and we have to jump from couch cushion to couch cushion, or we're going to get eaten by the sharks. Right. Like yeah. that's easy for us to do or fairy tale land and create little people out of, pieces of rocks and sticks. Like it's, it's, we live in that world. And so growing up is traumatic. You don't have to have major trauma in order to have hurts and wounds as we grow. Mm -hmm. And even just disappointing things as children or having things that we don't know how to interpret when we see adults arguing or uh, maybe the adults in our lives struggle with their own issues and they don't mm -hmm. know how to be present for us, or they don't know how to just love us the way that we need and want to be loved. We don't know how to interpret that as a child as anything other than something must be wrong with me. Mm -hmm. I must be flawed in some way. I must be broken. I must be unlovable. And that gets lodged in our subconscious. And we don't even realize that until we get older and we start yeah. realizing that there's always this stop that'll that prevents us from really going all in to loving ourselves and prioritizing ourselves there's something that says but but you're really you don't deserve that like come on girl you don't you don't get to have all those things yeah, you really yeah, truly yeah, want. yeah and so we pull ourselves back we we just keep not allowing ourselves to pour into ourselves for this fear of just really not feeling worthy of it. So I think that's one reason is it stems way back from childhood, but then there's also a lot of societal pressures that, you know, do you, you need to be a servant of other people and, and you got to serve others first. And that's, you know, how we need to live our lives, but we can't pour from an empty cup. Yeah. And, and so I think part of it is self-love also gets kind of a bad rap, like, like you're being selfish mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, and really it's, it's self-honoring. And even just to take the word love out of it, I think it's really self-valuing. How mm -hmm. do you value yourself? And so, um, maybe if we replace love with value, we'll find it easier to do the things that value ourselves. When you really value yourself and know what your value is and accept that, then you're, you'll be comfortable with that around other people. Does that For make sure. sense? <laughs> makes sense in my head. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, so to the listener who's like, I really want to work on my value, my self love, what would you advise them, Jada? You know, I, I just start small. Like again, sometimes when we when we want to make changes, we we get so excited and we we take like this big giant leap. But you know, the the analogy again, we've been kind of speaking in analogies. How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So you know, I would say just think about one thing, one self loving gesture you could do every day. What would that be? And commit to it. Like what would that be? And maybe you just start with with drinking a big glass of water when you first get up and go, I love myself by drinking this glass of water. Or when you're taking off your makeup at night, you look at yourself and you say three or four things that you love about yourself or mm -hmm. things that you value about yourself. And so sometimes you can just say, I'm learning to love the woman mm -hmm. looking back at me. That really <laughs> makes me think of, like I said earlier, my audience is a lot of like late twenties women in their thirties. And we're in this time frame, you know, where there's societal pressure, do this, do that. Everyone is doing this around you. I don't know if you've ever seen, um, people on social media or anyone talk about them putting like a childhood photo on like a mirror or something. And whenever they're like thinking or saying something bad about themselves, they're talking to the inner, their inner child. It's like a childhood picture. I know people that literally do that. They have like a, a childhood photo of themselves on their bathroom mirror so that whenever they're gonna like, say something bad or I look fat or I don't like my wrinkles or whatever it is, they're talking to the, like the little girl that they were. That's a great visual. I ha I have not ever used that. Um, what I will sometimes tell people is to, um, it just depends on what you want to do and what you want your mirror to look like. But I'll sometimes just tell people to, to especially women, you know, um, to 
put on lipstick and, and kiss the mirror. And so you've got this visual of this, this, you're going to love you today. And you, you're brushing your teeth and you're like, oh, there's the kissy face. And you know, so you're like, oh, I'm going to say something. So sometimes it doesn't have to be a visual or even I'll just have people put like a sticky note on the mirror and just write like anything. It can just be a smiley face or it can be something, but it's a visual. Yeah. And why do you think that it's so hard in our society to celebrate like the progressive wins, like the smaller wins towards like the big win? I, I, I don't know, but I think culturally we, again, it's kind of what we talked about that horizon, like it has to be big enough for us yeah. to celebrate it. I think we don't, we don't see the fact that we maybe had a better night's sleep, you know, last night than the night before. And we're like, oh, that's awesome. Like I yeah. got to celebrate that, you know? I think that we, we just, part of that is we don't allow ourselves to kind of what we talked about to feel like we're always up here and it's just, it has to be big enough in order mm. for us to feel like it's worth celebrating. That's so true. That's so true. <laughs> and that can become crippling because if you are constantly only celebrating big things, if you never reach that or don't reach it at the uh, cadence that you want to or hope for, you'll constantly just always be disappointed. And as we've talked about, that can really return in like a physiological sense um, yeah. and really do a lot of damage. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's that stillness of listening and, and again, tuning back in to what is the essence of who we are, you know, mm -hmm. that as we've gotten more connected, we've gotten more disconnected from ourselves and it's that honoring of ourselves and especially your audience in you know, late twenties, early thirties, that's such a hard time of life. And yeah. it's, it's always this jockeying for, am I, am I doing what she's doing? She's pregnant. She's married. Oh my God, I'm behind. I'm failing. What's wrong with me? Why? And it's, it, we get sucked into that comparison and it, it can kill us. I mean, it, yeah. it really is. Um, there's a phrase, I forget it. Comparison is the, it's a thief of joy. Thank you. Yes. And, and it is because we have to just stay in our own lane and recognize that life is going to unfold in the way that is meant for us. And we will bloom when we are ready. It's funny that you bring up the like blooming at different phases because I have a lot of friends who are doing things at different phases. And even though it's wild, even though that that can bring like comparison or measuring up or feeling behind, it really honestly is a lot of fun to like see your friends do one thing. And then one year later, another friend is doing something different. Like that's really cool too. And like yeah. should also be honored and yeah. any listener, like uh, I'm about to be 31. Any listener, I promise you, you're not behind. And I promise you that life will <laughs> unfold as it should. And I promise you just like lean into the intuition. Like I wish I just believed in my twenties that it would work out. Like truly, like I wasted so much time just like being riddled with anxiety, worried that it like wasn't going to work out. And I'm like literally fine now. Those early twenties are really hard. Yeah. And you know, I have a lot of um, clients who are in that age group that are struggling with that self-identity and that feeling of success and how do I, you know, trust who I am. And, and it takes a little, it does take a little bit. And, and just recognizing that we all have different journeys and they're all beautiful and how wonderful that it is that they're all different, you know, and, and to not get hung up on comparing yourself to someone else in your life, you know, yeah. it just, yeah. So you're wise beyond your years, which is awesome. Oh, thank you. I love that. <laughs> My parents will love to hear that. So I'm going to tell them that you said that. <laughs> um, Jada, thank you so much for coming on the Sir Thriving podcast. This was such an insightful conversation. Um, I feel like I got a nice little one-to-one -one opportunity just to pick your brain. And I really hope listeners can take a lot of tangible skills and um, tools away from this. Any last words of insight or wisdom that you would like to share? Oh gosh. Well, first of all, thank you so much. I enjoyed it so much. And I always love to talk about all things health and wellness and how we can love ourselves better. And, and as a result, like reach our health and wellness goals and just feel like we're, we're living our best life, you know, and that we're creating a life we love and one that loves us back. And I think that 
I would, I guess what I, one nugget would be to just give yourself permission and time to invest in yourself every day. Just pick a time where you're just going to be very intentional about doing something that is loving, that feels loving and valuing to you. Mm -hmm. Just do something every day for you. Yes, you can do it. You can do <laughs> we it. all can. We all can. Thank yes. you so much again. Oh, and where can people find you? Um, you can find me uh my website, which is solviasoul.com, uh, on Instagram, which is at Solvia Soul. Um, I'm on TikTok, which is ridiculous because my kids all make fun of me. Um, <laughs> they're like, Mom, do not go on TikTok. I'm like, I'm it. gonna do it. Yeah. So I'm over there too. Um so you can, you know, you can just even Google my name, Jada Butler, and, and you know, all my stuff will pop up. So that's really where people can find me. And it's, again, it's soul, S-O-U-L via S-O-L-E. And the whole idea is that we, we find our soulful selves through the instrument and the vessel, vessel of our bodies. Amazing. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing for your clients and coming on again to sharing with all of our listeners and myself. And I'll put um, all of Jada's information where you can find her in the uh, in the bio too, so that they can have easy access. Thank you so much, Lisa. It was, a, yep. it was a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Sir Thriving. I hope you took some helpful information away from it and are feeling inspired. If you know someone who is surviving or thriving and would benefit from hearing this episode, feel free to send it over to them. Remember, sharing is caring. To leave a review or rating of the show, head to Spotify to follow, rate, and let me know what you think. All information about today's episode, guest, and podcast social handles will be in the description, so don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date.